Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday. Or week. Yeah, we have uh we'll end the week off. Finishing up chapter 35 and a little introduction to the 36. 36 is going to be like a, a little bit on the kind of interesting side from a, a few side angles, but it's just the genealogy of Esau. So it will be uh, interesting in its own realm. It'll sound like it's a long one, but really it's just a lot of names. But there's some interesting names in there. So I'll right, we'll get to that one. That'll be Monday. But that, uh, Today's is really interesting. I found some neat stuff having to do with uh, that tower we saw in the last, uh, in yesterday's last verse, check verse 21. And so I got a picture of it and a little backstory. And it's really kind of a neat backstory. One that you may want to save and, and a few months from now, re 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 say it, uh, uh, re talk about it. So let's uh, start with a prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for this time. We get to look in your word. And it, uh, find out some more uh, beautiful, interesting facts about uh, the life of the patriarchs that you can help us to fully understand your word and help us to apply it to your lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. I label this Jacob and Esau are going to uh, bury Isaac. Isaac is going to pass on. And Esau's kingdom of the Edom. I'll touch base on that just a little bit. So let me this picture in here. It's an interesting picture. Uh, and we're going to talk about this picture. Because this is that tower that I mentioned. Or at least what they believe it is. And an interesting backstory on what its uses were. And you can kind of see up top there, this is a, a little lookout area. And this particular one is all grown over with some kind of vegetation. And I got a couple of doorways down at the bottom here. Let's get some verses in here. Not looking at it. Because Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar. It has another name too, and we're going to touch on it here just for a second. Here we have a few details of what happened as Jacob finally made it uh, home. Uh, he's heading towards uh, Hebron. He's not quite there yet. The Tower of Edar what most believe is also known as the Tower of Flocks. And maybe just a place a shepherd could watch his flock. Uh, but following, I found out a bit more about this famous, most famous birth in history. This particular tower is actually located within a few hundred feet of Bethlehem. And what do we know happened in Bethlehem? Uh, let me see. Uh, ah, Jesus Christ was born. So. So as Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. Remember that old TV show? Uh, that was pretty, I, I, I got this commentary for, uh, off of a website and uh, that, that, that the person ended it by saying, and this is the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. So on the edge of the fields surrounding Bethlehem, where most of those sheep were, going even back to Ruth, remember Ruth and Boaz, uh, they, they uh, had lots of land in Bethlehem. And most people believe that the sheep that were destined to be the uh, sacrificial lambs for the, uh, for the purposes of sacrifice in the temple were kept uh, in a field uh, in around Bethlehem. And that this tower story fits right in with that. And that's why this, uh, I think it really is true. So in the edge of the fields, surrounding Bethlehem, where most of these sheep were being born, there was a two-story stone tower called the Migdal Edar Tower. Uh, Israeli archaeologists recently found this tower, and the picture is of the uh, recent archaeological excavation uh, you see there. The picture. This tower is mentioned in the book of Micah regarding the announcement of the birth of Messiah. So let's look at that verse. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. I know sometimes some of these, uh, these uh, prophecies can seem a little vague, uh, but that, uh, uh, when you study all these different words, and particularly most people say if you read it in the natural language, 
It really, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, I keep saying some of these days, I want to learn, I learn Hebrew and Greek, but uh, I'm not good at learning languages, but uh, I would love to be able to read some of this stuff in the actual natural language. But in plain English, this is saying that the Messiah will be revealed from the Migdal elder, the tower of the flock. So, so the, uh, as it's been told, and as it's told in the uh, Septuagint, the priests uh, would come in the springtime, uh, or when, when, when uh, typically when, uh, uh, when uh, lambs were being born in the spring. Most animals are born in the spring. But the uh, some of the priests would actually come down here and stay here during that period of time, and they would actually climb up in that tower where they could see out over to the, over the sheep. Uh, and the priest would climb the tower and look out over all the flocks to see any signs a sheep was about to give birth. Sheep usually get fidgety, paw the ground, and or separate themselves from the flock just before birthing a lamb. When the signs were noticed, they would bring the sheep to the tower's ground floor where it would give birth in a ceremonial clean area. As you can see at the bottom there, that's probably that area maybe to the left. When the lamb was born, and if it was without blemish, it was immediately wrapped in strips of cloth made from old priestly underwear. <laughs> the purpose was to make sure the lamb would stay unblemished. Uh, the priest would then put the lamb in a manger to keep it safe from getting trampled. Should have got a picture of a manger too. Uh, but a manger is a big cement. It's, it's used for feeding the flock, but it's like a cement stone uh, device that... Uh, has a, has a dug, it's dug out in the middle and it has edges around it. So you can actually put a small lamb on the inside of it uh, and it'll be protected because it's made out of uh, stone. So it'll be another time when I, have, I actually have a picture of one. Uh, but the picture, the, the purpose was to make sure that the lamb would stay unblemished. The priest would then put the lamb in a manger to keep it safe from getting trampled. So when the angel of the Lord told the shepherds in the field that the savior had been born, and the sign was he would be wrapped in the same cloth as the sacrificial sheep and placed in a manger. They would have immediately understood the significance of the sign. And that verse, uh, when, so, when, so when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go, let us go straight to Bethlehem. Then we see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And of course, we see that in Luke 2.15, the famous passage. And it came to pass, the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let's go even unto Bethlehem and see the thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. So it's obvious that the shepherds know exactly where to go with only limited info. They headed to the birthing tower. Well, they found Joseph and Mary with Jesus lying where sacrificial sheep would lie. And of course, don't miss the fact that the first clothes Jesus wore were the clothes of a priest. I love that story. Even if it's not true, it's cool. <laughs> so when you hear the Christmas story this year, uh, we hope you have a chance to share, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. And so I found that, uh, have you ever heard of Compass International? Uh, they're a... Uh, they're an organization, a really devout uh, Christian brothers and sisters who spread the word of uh, the word of God. And uh, they used to have a conference every year that was really good, uh, but a uh, really good organization. And so uh, that's where I got that information from. I give them credit for that. So we start off on a good, good, good note, uh, except we're going to have one little bad note here in a minute. But uh, so let's get back to, to Genesis 35, 22. And I hope that was, uh, I, I really got a kick out of that. So back to Jacob and his 12 children. And so he's leaving this area and, uh, and or he's just getting to this area. And another major sin happens. So verse 22, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and laid with uh, Behila, his father's concubine. That's one of his wives. And Israel heard it. Now, Israel, again, is another name for Jacob. Now, the sons of Jacob were 12. And so that's the uh, only thing that really comments there about it. Uh, it will we'll say, we'll say more later on, particularly when we get to uh, Genesis 49 
And let's just look at a few verses on this particular thing. Genesis forty nine four. Unstay. This is this is that uh, when Jacob was actually telling his sons about their uh, what kind of people they were going to be in their future. And this was the one about uh, Reuben. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Thou defilest it, thou it. And he went up to my couch. And of course, there's a law on this in Leviticus eighteen eight specifically of this law. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover, is thy father's nakedness. First Chronicles 5, 1 and 2. Also, now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn. But for so much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright right was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. But Judah prevailed above his brethren, and, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. It's kind of interesting here, too, is it? Uh, so we have the first three sons, uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, all defied, uh, defied God and performed and doing things that were completely against God. And now the, they've lost their uh, status to be able to be the tribe that the Messiah comes from. The next one in line is Judah, uh, and that's where Jesus is ended up getting born from. But the actual birthright, the most righteous of all the children, was actually Joseph, and he's going to get the actual birthright, as we're going to see when we get to the, that that portion of Genesis. So the continuation. We will see as a type of Jesus as he returns at the end of the tribulation and a type of Benjamin will come to completion. Uh, that's the two sons of, uh, we're talking about uh, Joseph and his son and his uh, younger brother, Benjamin. So it'll actually be the children of Rachel that actually get the most blessing out of all the 12. Okay. I guess some other verses on this. Uh, first, uh, and 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It's reportedly common, uh, common that is fornication among you and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one shouldn't have his father's wife. Something that was going on in Corinth also. So here we have another major sin uh, Reuben committed and, and as such lost his birthright. So the continuation of the blessed tribe to bring forth the Messiah falls to the fourth son, Judah, and the birthright to Joseph. Not only because of his righteousness, but also if you, if you, when, you, when you research Joseph, he's one of two people that nothing ever negative is ever, ever said about him. Uh, he is a member of a very, very small group uh, in the Bible. And Daniel was the other one. Uh, very famous Bible character to get that honor. There was one woman too, Mary, uh, by the way. I thought I could show you a couple of these verses. Daniel 9.23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, this is an angel talking to Daniel, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Jumping over to chapter 10, verse 11, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. And again, another angel. And going down to verse 19, another angel. And said, O man greatly beloved. Uh, that's the only thing I'm really concentrating on, is the fact that he was always greatly beloved by the Lord. Uh, and then if, if you research his life, he, the, nothing ever negative in the Bible was ever said about him, that he was a man, he was God's man. Never committed a, a how should I put this? Uh, we're all sinners, even Daniel and, uh, and Joseph. But they, they spent their time, their eyes set on God, and they were able to maintain themselves from committing any outward signs of sin uh, that we can point to in the Bible. I'll say it that way. Uh, of course, we're all sinners, uh, but that uh, at least within the Bible uh, narrative, there was nothing ever negative said about them. Okay, continuing on. Verse 23. Now we're going to get into it. We're going we're to list all 12 of the sons. 
The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. Those are all from Leah. The sons of Rachel, are Joseph, and Benjamin. Verse 25, and the sons of Behi, uh, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali. And also uh, Genesis 35, 26, the sons of Zephi, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Panorama. We have a listing of the sons of Jacob by his different wives. Actually, Joseph and Benjamin were the two boys that were outstanding. The others just didn't turn out all that well. Again, this proves the fact that God does not bless a plurality of wives. This is something uh, J. Vernon McGee commented on. A family of Jacob ought to illustrate this fact to us. Although Uncle Laban was responsible, of course, Jacob went along with it. And he could have at any point said that, uh, no, I'm not doing it. And, uh, or not married the other three and stayed with Leah, uh, which would not have been a great option for him, but Moving on to verse 27. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, and Merimed. Merimed is another name for uh, Hebron. Unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. Again, Esau and Jacob get together. Uh, so far, so good. They're still not having any problems. But we're going to start really looking at what happens when uh, we talk about Esau when we get into chapter in Genesis 36. And what and some of the things his family did, his descendants did. So now, I, now it's interesting too that Isaac is still alive. He lived to be 180 years old under the city of, uh, which uh, in, there in Hebron. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died of being gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. His son Esau buried him. So he was an invalid for over 50 years, blind and so forth. It's a sad way to end your life. Do uh, you remember back when uh, when Jacob was leaving, uh, that uh, the whole reason the whole incident happened was that uh, uh, Jacob had uh, gone blind and that he, was, he figured he was dying. So he was going to give the blessing to one of his sons. That ends chapter 35, and uh, and now I'm going to move into a little, since we've got plenty of time, I'm going to move, I'm going to take the first eight verses of chapter 36, kind of a little introduction into this chapter. This chapter is all about, uh, I thought I would just mention one more thing. We, we, we talked about it before, I forgot this part, and uh, we know that uh, we, had, we had already buried. Uh, Rachel in her own tomb uh, yesterday, but that uh, now it's bearing Isaac, and Isaac ended up going into that same tomb in Hebron that uh, that uh, his wife went into years before, and that was uh, here's a really old picture of it. Uh, one on the left is Rebecca, and now the new one is the tomb of Isaac on the right. These two here, that's a really old picture of it. Here's some of the uh, more new color pictures I showed you before. I think it goes Abraham, I mean, uh, Isaac and Rebecca. But I could have them backwards. <laughs> the other one was labeled. Same here, this angle here. And this is the outside of the building, if you remember correctly. Uh, this is something you can see today. This is a wall that actually that, that was built around it. If you look real close, this ain't the greatest picture. But over in this corner here uh, is, a, is that outside wall. And the actual tombs and everything are on the inside. This church was built above them. And Herod, originally, the the, tomb, the, uh, the tombs were underground. So where you see those buildings there, those are actually above the tomb. They're actually under under this level. And there's a stairway that goes down underneath, but the, uh, the caretakers will not won't let anybody down there. So they put these above them to show where their bodies lie. Remember that these particular patriarchs are... Well, actually, Abraham was the main one. He is uh, shared by three different religions. Uh, then the others are shared by two different religions. And so that's, uh, uh, it's always been a big controversy over who, who's, uh, whose holy place is this? Because 
the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews all share in uh, the same uh, background. I think that's all I got for this particular part. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's the genealogy of Esau. We'll get to that probably more tomorrow than today. Well, I'll bring my map back and uh, we'll take a look here. We're at the, uh, let me make that a little bigger. So right now uh, we are in around Bethlehem here and we're heading down to Hebron. You see, it's not very far away. So. And actually, we're going to be talking about the Edomites. Uh, maybe I should have got that map. Uh, let me get that map. Okay, let's, let's switch to this map. And so we're right here in Hebron. This is end up going to be the area of Judea. So we can get an idea where Jacob, uh, where Esau is. This is the kingdom of Edom. And uh, the one place we're going to be talking about tomorrow is Petra. Uh, we've talked about on a few occasions. We're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit more about Edom and its relationship with its neighbors, the Moabs. Uh, and even we're going to mention Ammon a little bit too. Uh, when it comes to his Ammon, these are all descendants out of Esau. All these different tribes over here. So... Pretty much most of Jordan is actually uh, a, uh, is mostly a Muslim, but they they follow again the uh, Esau side of uh, uh, Abraham's Isaac's uh, children. Okay, so let's take a look at verse. We're in the chapter thirty six. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. So again, whenever you say Esau, you might as well say Edom. Uh, one and two, are the, uh, they're both the same basic. Uh, Edom just means red, basically what it means. So let's take a look at the beginning of the next chapter, which is uh, Esau's genealogy. We won't spend a great deal of time on this chapter as Esau and his descendants ultimately are enemies and God's judgment on these people group is the topic of the book of Obadiah. Uh, we see God's basic prophecy was well-founded if you go back in time, uh, prophecy has stated that, that God uh, had a dislike for Esau, but he loved Jacob. Uh, and so we see that in uh, Micah 1, verses 2 and 3. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Well, not right away. Uh, that's, this is more, that's more of a prophecy. But as we know, God is the judge in these matters and he will ultimately deal with them. Uh, and I'll just show you a little bit about how he dealt with them uh, and why. We get into numbers and this is the story that starts the, uh, the real negativity between the uh, Israel and, uh, and the uh, Edomites. <laughs> So Numbers 20, I'm going to read verses 14 through 21. And Moses sent messages from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith to thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befalled us. Remember, this is some 400 years after uh, what we're talking about here in Genesis. And when they go down into Egypt, they're in Egypt for over 300 years. And so and they travel into the wilderness for 40 years. And this is the point where Moses is starting to lead the, uh, the people uh, into the promised land. And he's getting ready to come by. And so he's coming from basically over this area, from uh, Egypt. And he asks if he can cross the kingdom of Edom to head towards uh, this area up here. Actually, he's going to come up along this backside of the river and come in from Jericho. That's the idea. <laughs> And basically, what we're going to read here is that uh, the kingdom at that point is going to say no. So let's pick that up, pick up where that it lays off. So Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. That saith the brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. 
how our fathers went down to Egypt and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And, we, and when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and have brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the utmost of thy border. Uh, that, that one don't have a, a Kadesh, but it's, Kadesh is basically, basically over in the general area. This map don't have it on it. It's actually down near the tip. I don't know if I have a map real quick. It shows Kadesh, just so you know where it is. Pictures real quick, see if I got one of Kadesh. I want to take a bunch of time I'm trying to find it. Too small. Um, I don't worry too much about it. Maybe this one. No, well, at least this one I'll show you real quick what I'm talking about. It's basically down near here, I believe, right at the tip of this uh, area here is where Kadesh is, if I'm remembering correctly. And so they're heading into this area and right in, uh, going up through this area, and this whole area in through here is where uh, uh, Moab is. Well, it's actually right here. But remember that Moses ended up going down and going into Mount Sinai and then coming up this way. If you uh, know that story, oh, if we move on into Exodus, we'll be talking about that a lot at the end of this one. So, uh, so we not pass through the fields or through. Uh, so he's basically saying, through thy country, and we will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards. Neither will we drink the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway, and we will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. King's Highway runs up through here. If I memory serves, right along the backside of the Black Sea. I mean, the uh, Dead Sea. <clears throat> Edom said unto them, Thou shalt not pass by me, at least I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I, and if I and my cattle drink thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. Now, he's not going to stop and, and, and stay for any period of time. <clears throat> and he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. <clears throat> Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his borders, and wherefore Israel turned away from him. So that is the basic problem, and it gets worse. Uh, going to Deuteronomy 23.7. Thou shalt not abhor thy. Now, this is God speaking, and and this and and some people take this as uh, well. Maybe God does love them. Well, no, that's what He's saying here. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. That means that you should not attack, for he is thy brother. Uh, so that because he's your brother, even if he's being mean to you, uh, basically uh, you're not supposed to attack him or uh, or, or dishonor him. Uh, and and. And God goes on to say, Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. Because they did take care of you for a lot of years, even though they were, you were slaves there. So God is basically saying here, don't, uh, don't mess with them. Go on to Isaiah 63.1. Now this is talking, this is a prophecy of Jesus and what's going to happen in the end times. This ain't happening yet. This is a prophecy that's going to happen at the end of the uh, tribulation. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that, that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's talking about the return of Jesus, and we'll be right behind him uh, for this prophecy. And then I guess I'll say one more. 
Ezekiel uh, 25, 12, and 13. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judea, Judah, by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom, will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. So that's God speaking, and that's what ultimately he is going to do to Edom. But basically, like we always say, that uh, vengeance in his mind, saith the Lord, means that let God handle it, not us. And that we should, we should pray for our enemies. Okay, continuing on. Back to Genesis 36, verse 2. So Esau took his wives of the daughters of Cana, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Elamai, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. So these are two of his wives. <clears throat> He's going to have one more wife, uh, which is the uh, one there that comes from Ishmael's uh, genealogy. So Abraham was determined that Isaac not take a wife from among the daughters of Canaan, but he disobeyed Abraham. As we remember back in Genesis 24, 37. And my master made me swear, saying that I shall not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. So Esau's marriage to a Canaanite woman caused much grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, and this is uh, in Genesis 26, 34, and 35. This is where Rebekah was reflecting with, uh, with uh, Isaac about this situation. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Berai the Hittite, and Bashamath, that's the daughter of Elon the Hittite. That was the daughter of Ishmael. <clears throat> which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So uh, that was a very painful situation for them too. And that's why they intentionally got Jacob to go up to Laban to get a wife uh, out of the correct uh, group of people. So I think Abraham and Isaac both knew that uh, at some point in time, God was going to eliminate all these particular uh, cultures that had gone into idolatry and turned their backs on God. So I'll just take a few more verses here. And, and Beshemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Naboth, and Adar bare to Esau, Ephaz, and Beshemath bare, oh no, I think I'm actually going to stop there. Well, we're at 32 minutes, and uh, we'll pick these up. Oh. We got quite a bit more if I go any further. I'll just finish up the verse eight. That's where I that's where I uh, went to. Okay, just the beginning part of this. And uh, Abilamai bare Jewish and Jal and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts, and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. But their riches were more than they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strange could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. So, uh, and, we'll, and just one more verse. To the Remember, if you remember back to Genesis 27, 38, Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Remember that verse? Well, somehow God did bless him. He's got quite the, uh, he's got so much cattle and so much wealth that he has to separate from his brother's area uh, uh, because of uh, the size of their herds. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that Esau's painful cry to Isaac, have you only one blessing, Father, proved to be unfounded. <laughs> and God blessed Esau because he was a descendant of Abraham, and God blessed him in the only way he really cared about, materially. Uh, so we'll stop there. But I think it's interesting that whenever, whenever uh, Uh, 
realized I got to fix something. Uh, anyways, so we'll stop there and we'll say a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this time to look in your word and for all these neat, uh, interesting things we find out about how, how the whole Bible just ties together, Lord. Anyway, it's just amazing how these all these stories are intertwined with each other. And we give you praise and thanks for the uh, beautiful way that you uh, allowed us to see this and to know that the Bible is true because uh, there's no way that a mere man could, uh, could have come, could have had this happen in the perfect way that it did. So we give you praise and thanks and uh, love you so much. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay. So I will see all guys on Sunday and I hope you have a great weekend and uh, we'll talk to you later.